For this year's Morton Lecture, I'm delighted to introduce Ben Harder. Ben is Managing Editor-in-Chief of Health Analysis for U.S. News & World Report. In those roles, he oversees the publication's portfolio of data-driven patient decision support tools, freely available at usnews.com and used by more than 15,000 consumers each day. These tools include hospital rankings and ratings, nursing home ratings, and more than 850,000 searchable online profiles of individual physicians. That's you and me. Ben's work has been published in the British Medical Journal, in JAMA, in the Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, Science News, USA Today, and the Washington Post. Although I actually am meeting Ben for the first time in person this morning, I've known him virtually for many years through social media, on Twitter, where we've had many public and private conversations. He, I found him to be amazingly engaging and really committed to communicating to and with practicing physicians, which is why I've invited him today. Ben earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard University and completed a journalism fellowship at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2002. He's been an associate, or has been an editor at US News since 2007, and his topic today is measuring hospital quality and more. Please join me in welcoming Ben Harder to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Duzak. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with all of you today, and I will say that Twitter is the, is the great connector. Um, there's a story that I'd like to share with you about, that, that begins around the time of my birth, um, but it's about a different boy who was born to a different mother in a different hospital. Now, I was born healthy, and he was born with total anomalous pulmonary venous return. TAPVR is a rare and severe congenital heart defect, and a very high-risk surgery is necessary in infancy. Now, it's well established that when it comes to high-risk surgeries, patients are best off being treated by hospitals with ample experience with the particular procedure that they require. But this child was treated at a hospital that had never before seen a case of TAPVR. Nevertheless, the surgeon was confident that he could do it. And he actually did. The, the surgery itself went smoothly. It was in the ICU afterward that the child came to harm. You see, a blockage developed in his tiny breathing tube. And it went undetected far longer than it should have taken someone to notice and correct the problem. As a result, he experienced an irreversible hypoxic brain injury. When an error occurs in a hospital, and unfortunately, as you know, errors occur in hospitals every day in this country, it's common for hospitals to undertake a root cause analysis to figure out what was the precipitant of the cascade of events that led to that patient harm. The notion is that by identifying that root cause, we can intervene in the first step of that chain of events and stop that cascade from beginning again. So what was the cause? What was the root cause of this child's injury? Was it a lack of training in the management of the neonatal airway? Was it a breakdown in the hospital system of monitoring patients' oxygen levels? Or was it simply understaffing? All of those factors probably contributed, but I don't think any of them was the root cause. In my view, the root cause of that child's injury is that he was treated at that hospital at all. His parents should have been directed to a hospital with the experience and the team in place to get their son the outcome he deserved. But they didn't know that another hospital would have been a better option and no one told them. It's not that it was unknowable, but the information they needed was not accessible to them. Now that event happened more than 40 years ago. And today we're lucky to have multiple free publicly available resources that could help parents like those parents make an informed decision about where to get care for a son with TAPVR or with any other number of, of medical conditions. One of those resources is a clinical registry run by the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Um, another is 
the best children's hospitals rankings, one of our rankings, um, and that's a project that I oversee at US News. But neither of those projects or any other a transparency project that might have helped those parents existed at the time. Now in the intervening years, that injured child has grown up. He's now an injured man. He isn't and never will be the man he could have been. But he is something else. He's my cousin. Now before we begin to measure hospitals or medical practices or doctors or any other service provider, it's imperative that we understand why we are undertaking to do the measurement. And by my count, there are three primary reasons that we might seek to measure healthcare provider performance. The first of these is for quality improvement. If we can identify our gaps and our strengths, then we have an opportunity to remediate the gaps and to teach those strengths to others. The second is for accountability, and I would include reimbursement or pay for performance in that. Um, those who pay for health care or those who regulate it um, have, a, have an interest in making sure that the service they're getting is relatively free of defects. The third um, application, and this is what we call it in, in measurement science, the measure application, the third measure application of measuring healthcare providers is decision support. And this application is unique in a sense that it requires publishing quality metrics. It's not enough to have measured it, but we actually need to make information available to people like my cousin's parents so that they can make an informed decision about where they seek care. Now, it's this third application that I'll devote most of my remarks to this morning. It's not because the other two are unimportant, but patient decision support is what we focus on at US News and World Report. It's why we undertake to measure hospitals. And there are certain decisions that we make in the methodologies and the data that we use that is in service of that particular measure application. Sometimes the uh, approach that one needs to take to measure for accountability or to measure for quality improvement is different. Even the measures that need to be used and the way they need to be uh, adjusted uh, can be different. And so it's important when thinking about a, a measurement program or a public reporting program that one keep in mind the measure application. What is its purpose? Now, if you remember nothing else from my talk about measurement and public reporting, I hope you'll remember these three points. First, public reporting, if it's good, is a public good. And what I mean by that is that if we measure well and give patients and the public the information they need to make informed, engaged decisions about their health care, we are doing a service to society. Second, bad public reporting is to be feared. And fear can't be ignored. It has to be overcome. When people express concerns about public reporting, they, they are concerned, they're fearful mostly of unintended consequences. Perhaps we'll, we'll identify the wrong providers as good or bad and mislead patients instead of leading them to better care. Or perhaps in the process of measurement, we'll create perverse incentives that encourage uh, doctors or hospitals to avoid uh, the sickest, most needy patients. Um, these are some of the concerns about unintended consequences, and they're not, they're, they're, they're very legitimate concerns. They're, they're not to be dismissed. But that's bad measurement. So I think it's important that we identify how to do good measurement. The primary difference, and this is my third takeaway message, between good and bad public reporting and measurement, I think lies not in the data that we use for measurement, but in who does the measuring and how carefully they do it. So I want to tell you a little bit about how we do it at US News, um, and, uh, and I'll give a counterexample or two um, about how the federal government does measurement. Um, one thing, go back for one moment here. You know, in your line of work, you need an image to make a diagnosis. But who made the scanner that took that image, 
uh, whether it's digital or on film, whether even probably to some extent the resolution of the image may not matter that much in terms of whether you're able to make the right diagnosis. What matters much more is your expertise in interpreting the data in that image and pulling out the key information that you need. And I think it's the same thing with quality measurement in that the data can be very noisy, but if the people who are doing the measurement know what they're looking for and know how to recognize the patterns they need to pull out, the measurement can be very valid. So since you're image readers by profession, I thought I would test your uh, knowledge here, and I'm gonna ask you to uh, interpret this one. Little, little challenging, isn't it? What if I gave you a, a hint? Um, it's a lateral radiograph of the nasopharynx of a 19-year-old male, um, and part of what you're looking at is a foreign object. Still having some trouble, right? It's not because the data's bad, and it's not because you're not experts. It's because right now we are focused on the pixels and not the big picture. So let's zoom out and see the big picture. And suddenly, a very interesting clinical picture emerges. This young man was serving in the Colombian Armed Forces, uh, and during a training exercise, a comrade in arms accidentally shot him in the face with a grenade launcher. Now, fortunately for our young soldier, the grenade didn't detonate, and fortunately for the surgeons who operated on him wearing Kevlar, didn't detonate in the OR either. Um, in fact, they not only survived, they got a very nice Lancet case report out of it. <laughs> but coming back to our image, to our data set here, it doesn't matter to you whether the pixel at the center of this image is white or black. What matters is your ability to understand what's going on in the big picture. So I'm very lucky to have a, an incredibly talented team of co-investigators, both US News employee analysts um, and data contractors, who help me interpret the big picture in the data sets that we analyze. Um, it's also not just because of the smarts of these individuals and of our teamwork that we're able to do the work we do, but because we have an enormous well of support from the clinicians and researchers who we engage to help us in this process. And so this is just an overview of the structure of the various advisory groups that help us with our methods and help us identify data sources. And you'll notice that uh, radiology is represented toward the lower left of this. Okay, I have a, another quiz for you, and this one's a little bit fairer. Um, actually, these are the four multiple choice questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask for a show of hands. So if you're feeling brave, you can uh, let me know what you think on, on these questions. Um, so the first one um, is in ranking community hospitals, and that includes teaching hospitals, which is the data source that US News uses for its most heavily weighted measure? You can see three options here. Survey of subspecialists, asking them about where they would refer their sickest patients. A survey of hospitals about their characteristics. Or a database of Medicare claims, of Medicare bills. Who would say A? Okay, how about B? And how about C? Oh, very nice, very nice. You're correct. Um, all three of these are data sources that we use, so no one's really wrong, but the most heavily weighted measures come from Medicare billing claims. Um, these are records. We have a record of every inpatient claim, every inpatient stay that Medicare has paid for, and we're able to see incredibly rich patterns in these data when analyzed over, over multiple years and, and thousands of hospitals. Okay, second question. Which of these measures is used both by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in their uh, federal um, quality measurement programs um, and by US News? And so you can see there's a readmission measure that was developed by researchers at Yale for measuring uh, readmissions of heart failure patients. There's something called the PSI-90, which is a patient safety indicator looking at uh, hospital-acquired uh, conditions. And there's um, an HAI measure looking at infections, and this is captured by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Option D is all of them, and option E is none of them. How about A? No. B? C? And D, all of the above. Okay, how about E? E is correct. We got a few 
folks over here who know, who know our methodology. So all three of these measures are used by CMS for, measure, for public reporting and or for payment. Um, none of them are used by US News. And part of that is about the measure application. Some of these, like the infection measures, we think are useful for hospitals in tracking their own progress on uh, avoiding hospital-acquired infections. But because of inconsistencies in how different hospitals collect these data, they are actually not useful for comparing one hospital's performance to another. That is uh, some of the findings we've had in the empirical work we've done, and there's literature uh, to support our decisions on all three of these measures. In fact, if this were, um, you know, when I speak to, to cardiology audiences, um, the readmission measure in heart failure is one of the most contentious measures uh, of the federal public reporting program. We don't use readmission in measuring a performance on heart failure. Okay, this is the third of the four questions. I did mention that we have a survey of subspecialists asking them about uh, hypothetical referrals. Which of these is true? That hospital administrators control which doctors take that survey? Um, that hospitals that get high scores on this expert opinion survey also tend to get high rankings from US News? Um, or that um, hospitals would, that are ranked by US News would be ranked regardless of whether we use this survey or not? Um, a. B and C. Great, I think you all got it right. A is the only one that's wrong. There is a correlation between performance on this reputational survey or expert opinion survey and hospitals being ranked by US News. But it's important not to confuse that correlation with causation because even if we were to remove that measure from our rankings entirely, more than five and six hospitals that are ranked today would still be ranked. In other words, they are ranked based on the other measures that we use, and this is just sort of the icing on the cake. The last question here, um, we rank various different programs at hospitals, including cardiovascular, oncology. We don't rank radiology, and why is that? Is it A, because we don't think radiology is important? Anyone want it? Okay, <laughs> I'm here today. Hopefully that says something. Um, is it because patients don't really have a choice, at least when they're in patients and who reads their scan? Or is it that patient decision making isn't really focused on radiology, but on their clinical condition? B? C? Okay, well, they're both right. Um, but I think C is the most important one. I mean, C, B is... We do focus on elective care or things that people have uh, some opportunity to, to make a decision around, and, and very often in the inpatient context, um, they, they can't choose uh, who, who reads a scan. But it, it's really because patients have a, uh, they have a condition, a health problem, a diagnosis, a procedure that they need, and we're trying to help them make an informed decision about hospitals around that condition. And I think that's important when we consider the measure application, because when we're measuring for patient decision support, it's not enough to say, this is a good hospital, that's a bad hospital. We have to say, what is this hospital good at? Because it may be good for cardiovascular patients and not good for oncology patients. So that's one of the ways that we try to provide meaningful decision support. It has to be clinically relevant to the patient. It also has to be scientifically valid, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we, uh, how we tackle that. This is the interface that our, uh, our users use on usnews.com. And you can see here, if you look closely, there's a, a toggle between all hospitals and children's hospitals. So again, we help patients identify, or, or users identify um, what their need is on that dimension. And then we, there's also a drop down there that says specialties, procedures, conditions. And the idea is that somebody who needs heart failure doesn't care if the hospital is good at uh, hip replacement, say, or at, um, at uh, care of, uh, of dialysis patients. This shows the use of our website over the past five years. Um, at this point, we have over 200,000 people a day specifically looking up a healthcare provider on usnews.com. So that means that in the course of my remarks today, more than 10,000 people will look up a hospital, a doctor, or a nursing home on US News. And we've seen that growth in traffic. We've seen a very rapid growth in, in that traffic. So patients are clearly engaged and want information on provider performance. 
there's several different ways that we measure hospitals. Um, this is just hospitals. Um, and we use essentially three different methodologies. I won't go into all of them in detail, uh, but I think it's important to, to note that we look at different areas of care, different, different service lines or specialties in each of these areas. Um, I'll focus, well, for one thing, in each, depending on the, what we're measuring, whether it's pediatric care or uh, common procedures and conditions among adults, we use different data sources. And so again, I think there are, there are ways to pull information from many different data sources if you know what you're doing. Um, but I'm going to focus today just on one of the methodologies here that we use, and it's to evaluate hospitals in uh, nine different uh, relatively common service lines. These are services that many, if not most, acute care hospitals in this country offer, and, and some critical access hospitals as well. And we evaluate all of them. Again, if they have billed Medicare for the service, we have the data, and we're looking at it. So I've right across the top here the nine procedures and conditions that we evaluate using just that one of our three methodologies. And here's a, this table shows you the outcomes. These, there's a risk-adjusted outcomes that we look at to try to gauge the hospital's quality. And you can see from the plus signs that we don't use all six outcome measures in every single cohort of patients. We've used, uh, you know, through the clinical input we have, we've received, the literature we've reviewed, and our own empirical work, we've identified which outcome measures are most relevant and, and most uh, meaningful in each of these different conditions, and those are the ones that we've used. So I'm going to focus in just on hip replacement to give you a flavor of how this plays out then in our analysis. This is a visual abstract describing our hip surgery uh, um, rank rating uh, at the hospital level. And what you can see here is that we use those four outcomes you saw on the last slide um, as part of the information that we put into rating the hospital. We also use certain processes and structural measures of care. Uh, this is the Donabedian paradigm of structure, process, and outcomes. And so we've identified um, certain measures that, that add to the total information that we have, including volume. So again, if a hospital has more experience in a procedure, it's well established that they're likelier to get better outcomes. Lastly, we take those eight measures and we put them together using a, a complex model called the latent variable model, and we come up with an overall assessment of the hospital's hip replacement service line. So they may get a different rating in aortic valve repair or in COPD management, but their hip replacement rating will be high performing, below average, or low performing, or about as expected. Now you could ask, how can you possibly tell if my hospital is good at hip replacement from just eight measures? How do we even define quality? Well, when one is measuring something, one has to construct a model, right? And models can be very powerful, even sometimes with a limited number of measures in them. Um, it's not to say that if we used slightly different measures, we wouldn't get a different answer, but we've tested many different models using different combinations of measures, and we fundamentally get the same answer, no matter what. Most hospitals that are high-performing will be high-performing regardless of which model we pick. Now, models are, by nature, oversimplifications, right? They, they have to round off things. They have to uh, ignore information that can't be um, taken into to account or isn't, isn't accessible to the, to the measurers. And so it's natural to think that a model can't possibly capture the real world. But remember that physicists used models of how planetary bodies interact to land a man on the moon. And I think that's why the statistician George Box said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Now, we're lucky to have a, a very uh, engaged research uh, community that has kicked the tires of our rankings for many years. And so I'll, I'll just give you a taste of these, a couple of papers that were published in the last couple of months. Um, but, but there's a steady stream of research looking at the US News rankings and trying to understand and test its validity and its clinical uh, meaningfulness. Um, this study appeared in JAMA Cardiology a couple of months ago, I think, um, and it, it looked at um, independently derived measures of hospital performance and what the concordance between those measures was uh, with the US News rankings. Um, and what it found was that across a range of cardiovascular conditions, hospitals that US News identified as top ranked 
in fact, got better outcomes, um, particularly uh, better uh, mortality um, when you took patient severity into account. They had better patient experience. Um, there was one thing that they didn't do better on, at least not consistently, and that was readmission. And you remember I said that we have determined in our own data that readmission is not a good measure for heart failure. And specifically, it was in heart failure that these researchers found that readmission did not correlate with the US News rankings. There's another study I'll mention uh, briefly, which um, also was published in a JAMA uh, journal uh, in the last couple of months. And it looked at um, hospitals that are uh, ranked in US News in cancer, in, in complex or high acuity cancer care, and then looked at those that bear the same brand or have an affiliation with that hospital. It put up a banner saying, we're now partnered with the whatever clinic. Um, and, um, and wanted to understand, the study was looking at the quality of care and the outcomes in particular of these two groups of hospitals, those ranked by US News and Cancer and those that have the same brand. And what they found was that there was a distinct difference, that the ranked hospitals almost universally did far better on the outcomes they were measuring, and that the affiliates, there was a wide range of, of, uh, of outcomes and performance. And I think this substantiates a decision, a policy essentially that we've had in place for many years, which is that when hospital CEOs or, or health system CEOs approach me and my team and say, you know, we've got five hospitals here, uh, we get really good marks from you in this one, Can we, can't we just sort of mush them all together and say that our system is really good at cancer care? And we don't do that. And we don't do that because we know from our data that their affiliates often don't do as well as the flagship. Now I want to turn just for a moment to the star ratings that are published by CMS. Are any of you familiar with these, the, the uh, hospital star ratings? A little bit, okay. So um, in hospital C-suites, they seem to get people bent out of shape, but I think clinicians hopefully mostly ignore them. Um, the, um, there's some distinct differences both in the measures they use. So the, the data source, by the way, is the same. We're using the same set of Medicare claims that they are. We actually license the, the 60 million records that we use from Medicare and pay them a few thousand dollars a year for that. We're analyzing it differently. We are using different approaches to pull signal from and recognize the patterns in those big data sets. Um, so unlike the US News rankings, CMS's star ratings and also their financial penalties, their pay for performance measures that they apply to hospitals, um, appear to be biased against certain types of hospitals that we might expect to have sicker, more challenging patients. We don't see these patterns in the US News rankings. In fact, if anything, we see a little bit of the opposite. Um, so it's important to make that distinction. It's not about the data source. It's about who's doing the measuring and how. And if you're interested in understanding in more detail how and why we approach measurement the way we do, I would encourage you to read the, the JAMA viewpoint that my mentor and I published a couple of years ago. Um, if you're more about sort of real-time interaction, um, please engage with me on Twitter. I'm at Ben Harder. Um, and um, and, and as, as Dr. Duzak said, I uh, really enjoy the give and take, and I learn a lot from, uh, from clinicians and from researchers in, in interacting with them. So now I want to pivot to the question uh, of whether we can extend beyond the rating of hospitals and, and actually rate doctors. And I think that to some extent that question has already been answered because it's being done today, rating doctors, that is, um, by organizations like Yelp um, and Vitals and Health Grades, which are dedicated to patient review websites. Um, it's uh, being, being spread on social media like Facebook, and it's also you know, available on uh, ratings that, that Google users post. So we have information available to the public, to patients for decision support on doctor quality. The question is, is it clinically meaningful and is it statistically valid? So there have been a few studies looking at these data sources, uh, both just descriptively and, and trying to assess how, how valid and meaningful they are. Um, this study came out a couple of years ago and identified that Yelp and health grades were the two most heavily used of these patient review websites. So when you think about how patients are deciding what doctor to go to, these are among the most likely sources of information for them today. So again, if we, if we decide that that's bad public reporting, we need to figure out how to overcome it and what to replace it with. 
Um, by the way, both of these two websites ranked above hospitals' own websites and health insurers' provider directories in terms of their utilization by patients. And then this other study uh, looked at 28 different uh, ratings websites, including the two I just mentioned, um, and, and identified 600 doctors. They went through every site and looked at those 600 doctors, randomly chosen, tried to count the number of reviews that they had received just to see what's the sample size, how much information is there for patients out here. And what they found was that a third of these, and these were all uh, patient-facing physicians, I believe they were all surgeons, in fact, um, one third of them had no reviews at all. You could look at 28 different websites and you'd find no review. And the rest had less than one patient review per website. They had, in fact, the, the mean, if you can see in that orange bar there, for if you summed all 28 websites, you'd find seven reviews per doctor. So they had about a quarter of a review per website. It's a pretty inefficient way for patients to get information. And of course, if they're making a decision based on seven reviews, it's hard to know if that's a reliable signal. There's one more study I'll mention. This one looked at um, the ratings on these types of websites and correlated them to other independent measures of physician quality. They looked at some registry data. They um, asked those physicians uh, chairs for their opinions uh, about performance and so on. Um, and, and you can see that across these five different comparisons they did, there really wasn't a very uh, meaningful pattern. And then there's the story of uh, Monique Tello. I don't know if any of you read this in the Boston Globe two weeks ago, but I was quite struck by it. Um, she had um, blogged about um, the importance of vaccinating your children. And shortly thereafter, I think she'd had about 10 reviews on, on all uh, several major uh, review, patient review websites up to that point. And all of a sudden she had tons and tons and tons of reviews and they were all very negative. She got attacked by anti-vaxxers. And actually there's a theory circulating that it may not have been real anti-vaxxers, it may have been Russian bots that were pointed at Yelp and Health Grades and these other websites. So against this backdrop of public reporting that has some, some challenges, um, an organization attempted to uh, bring an objective approach to physician measurement. This is ProPublica. Um, and they're, they're a journalistic organization, so in some sense, uh, kindred, kindredship with US News, but they don't have 30 years of measurement experience. They don't have a dedicated team of data analysts uh, the way that, that I'm very privileged to have. Um, and what they did was they used Medicare claims um, to look at 17,000 or so different surgeons in different specialties, sub surgical subspecialties. Um, they um, identified how many surgeries each of these doctors had done in, uh, of eight different types of, uh, of procedures, and then they calculated a complication rate for them over a multi-year period. And the challenge, of course, is that they couldn't capture all complications. They were just counting deaths and then readmissions within 30 days for certain causes that, that they decided um, signaled a complication. Um, but there were some limitations in what they were doing, too, because for some of the eight procedures that they looked at, most of the procedure volume is actually performed outpatient, and they only had access to inpatient hospital claims, um, and also only, only Medicare claims. Um, so after their publication, there were several critiques that were issued by researchers about their methods um, and really scrutinizing the uh, limitations in their work, because again, they published these, they you know, named each of the 17,000 surgeons and said he or she is good at TERP or good at or bad at, uh, you know, lap cholecystectomy or whatever they were evaluating. And so some of the studies that came out, like this one, um, uh, which appeared in JAMA Surgery, um, looked at a, a, a rich clinical registry that tracks surgeon-level complications. And you can see from that plot in the lower left that there really was no relationship between the score that ProPublica assigned to the surgeons in this registry and their performance on the quality measures used in the registry. And then there was another study that highlighted the fact that for some of the procedures that ProPublica looked at, they were only capturing 4% of all procedures that were performed of that type. I think it was Lap Coley was the sort of the, the example. Um, and you can imagine that somebody who is, uh, who is hospitalized for a laparoscopic procedure that's usually performed outpatient is probably not representative of the other 96% of the, of the patients who undergo that procedure. So there's some opportunity for bias there. So I think 
against the backdrop of ProPublica's work and the Yelp reviews that, that we live with and, and the Russian bots, perhaps, that are, that are attacking Dr. Tello, we have to ask the question, is it possible to credibly rate doctors or, or surgeons? And I just want to tell you how U.S. News, you know, we don't do that at U.S. News, but I want to tell you how we would approach it at U.S. News um, because I think that the experience that we've developed over 30 years of measuring hospitals is very relevant. So I'm coming back here to the slide you saw earlier. This is the visual abstract of how we rate hospitals in hip replacement. We take basically the same approach. We have somewhat we have smaller sample size, certainly, for the number of surgeries that, that a given surgeon performs. But we can still take the, the same Donabedian paradigm of structure, process, and outcomes and, and attempt to apply it in this case. And so I think we would start with um, sort of the processes and characteristics of a surgeon's practice. And there are a few that I can think we can look at for many different types of surger, surgical specialties. These would include, are they board certified? Of course, most would be, so it wouldn't differentiate much, but it, it's an important signal, perhaps. Um, there's the volume outcome relationship that I, that I spoke about in my cousin's experience, and that's, uh, that's a, a useful signal for quality. Um, there's also been some very interesting research in the last couple of years in, in um, the British Medical Journal on procedural specialization, specialization. So even two surgeons who perform a similar number of a procedure, if one is doing that as uh, essentially the, the, sole, the exclusive focus of her practice and the other is um, doing that along with, uh, with various other things, um, there's evidence that the specialist is actually going to get better outcomes. Then there's some other process measures that we might be able to develop, um, such as does a doctor have an excess transfusion rate, which might either represent an old-fashioned practice or perhaps that they're having more complications than, than they need to in the OR. And then, of course, we have the suite of outcomes, and these would be essentially the same ones that I mentioned earlier, a couple others that, uh, that could be candidates. Um, and then we would, um, of course, risk adjust those outcomes to make sure that we're not penalizing uh, doctors who take on sicker patients um, or who have more challenging uh, case mix in, in some other way. And so these are the risk adjusters that we use in our hospital rankings, and we would use the same ones in, um, in looking at uh, surgeon quality. Um, we're adjusting for a, a wide range of medical comorbidities, and we're also including a, a measure of social risk. And we think that that's really important when it comes, again, to the measure application we have in mind, which is comparing hospitals or doctors in this case um, uh, with the expectation of, you know, if a given patient is choosing between A and B, and that given patient has a given set of comorbidities and a given social risk, which doctor is he better off with? So as a proof of principle, we actually did un undertake this, you use this methodology that I've just described um, to evaluate knee surgeons and hip surgeons. Um, and we looked again at our Medicare claims data. We have um, you know, these millions of, of records of, of, of total joint arthroplasty. And we identified more than 15,000 surgeons who had performed a de minimis number of, um, of, of knee replacements during our, our period in Medicare beneficiaries. And then we also identified about 12,000, 13,000 who had done hip replacement. There was some overlap between these groups because, again, not everyone is a subspecialist in only one of these two. Um, but we're able to separately evaluate each surgeon who does both in hip replacement and, and knee replacement. We found some differences in terms of where their strengths lay. Now, you can see here that um, about 16% of the surgeons in each group were identified in that pink wedge, and that's the, the surgeons we identified as statistically better than their peers. They were getting better outcomes. Um, they had uh, lower transfusion rates. Um, they were more specialized and had higher volume as well. But of course, we have to ask whether we're right. We don't, we don't know. There's no gold standard for us to, uh, you know, to, to look at to say, yeah, we, we, we identified the right sixth of surgeons as being high performers. So what we did was we tried to identify external proxies, so reasonable um, signals in other data sets, the, the data that we weren't using, and say, okay, well, we would expect this group of surgeons to be at least as good, if not better, than their peers. And so let's make sure that they're not doing worse in our results. And my, um, my, my very clever colleague, Dr. Def Jeff Doherty, um, identified these three and several others that, that we ran. 
Um, what we looked at, uh, among others, was uh, surgeons who had been elected to leadership positions in, in, their, in their society. And we figured that we shouldn't expect them to be much worse than their peers. And they might not be better, but, but we wouldn't want to see them being, uh, being inferior in our, in our measures. Um, and we also looked at those who had higher patient loyalty. So you can imagine that if a patient has her right hip replaced by surgeon A um, and then uh, needs the left hip replaced a few years later, whether she goes back to surgeon A or goes to someone else might be in some ways influenced by um, her experience and, and by the, the, the outcome that, that she experienced. And then we also looked at surgeons who had more uh, complex case mixes. And we wanted to make sure here in particular that we weren't penalizing uh, doctors who take on sicker patients. Again, that's the, the, the great fear with public reporting is that um, if you don't risk adjust properly, if you don't take account of the patient factors, that you end up penalizing the doctors or the hospitals that take on the sickest and most needy and you uh, could, in fact, get the wrong answer, directionally wrong answer in your results. So we wanted to make sure that those who have referral practices that bring them um, the, the complex, challenging cases weren't doing worse in our results. Might not do better, but in general, you would expect that those who concentrate the, the tough cases and get referred cases that have already had complications in other doctors' hands they'd probably be at least as good, if not better, than their peers. And so we plotted every surgeon we'd evaluated. This is in knee, but we got the same results in hip. Um, uh, who, these, were, these were essentially all, all the surgeons other than those who had you know, leadership roles in the AOS or another, uh, another association. Uh, and you can see there's a wide range of quality. Higher is better on this scale. Um, so there's some who are, who are way up there at the top and some who are pretty far below average. But, as you'd expect, that red dot indicates that, on, on the whole, they, are, they represent the national mean. And then we plotted the group of leaders who had been elected by their peers to these national positions. And what you can see is that they were all better than average, and that as a group, they were statistically better than their average peer. And so that was reassuring to us, um, and perhaps to the orthopods, because it meant that they hadn't elected idiots to their offices. So then we looked at the second test that I mentioned, the patient loyalty, and we wanted to see are the, the doctors who have higher rates of patients returning to them for the contralateral joint um, better or worse in our results. And you see again here that on the left, there's the, the rest of the population, and the right are those who have the highest patient loyalty. Um, and they are significantly better. It's not a big difference here, but you can see that the, the, uh, the, the whiskers there are very compressed around the red dot, um, and there is a statistically significant difference between these two groups. And then lastly, we looked at revision volume. So these are surgeons who had a large number of uh, revision operations where a patient had a complication or infection, and they were coming to them for help. And these cases had been excluded from the score, the, from the calculation of the surgeon's performance. Um, so it was an independent measure of, of, of complexity. But we figured that those who get revisions referred to them are probably getting more challenging index cases, the ones we were measuring as well. And so if they did worse in our score, it might be a sign that we weren't risk adjusting properly for those index cases. And what we found, as you can see here, is that they actually did far better than their peers. That the, the doctors who have the toughest case mix do better in the US News rating methodology. So I think the answer that we came to, uh, to that question, is it possible to credibly rate surgeons, is yes. In fact, we can, we can d identify high-performing hip and knee surgeons using only administrative claims. And so I want to, you know, I've, I've talked mostly this morning about the, um, the, 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 the measure application of patient decision support. Um, and again, that is what we do at US News. That's why we're here measuring hospital performance and, and publishing our results. Um, but I want to come back to um, one of the other measure applications that exists. And that's, um, that's one that I would imagine matters to many of you and, and to, to your medical peers. How can we use measurement to improve quality? 
Well, I mentioned the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the, the, the registry of, uh, of heart and lung surgeons that um, ha ha publishes, among other things, ratings of hospitals in pediatric and congenital heart disease. Um, and a colleague of mine, Steve Sternberg at US News, um, took data that's publicly available from the STS website, and he identified hospitals that had a high volume of um, the most complex of these congenital heart surgeries, the TAPVRs and other cases of that sort. And then he identified hospitals that had uh, treated a much lower volume. Um, I think the low volume uh, pair of bars here to, the, to your right is uh, represented uh, hospitals that had um, as few as two cases per year of the most severe uh, congenital heart defects. And then, of course, there was a, a group in the middle. And what he found was that um, when he did this work with, with the help of some researchers at Johns Hopkins, the, um, that he found that the high-volume hospitals had fewer mortality events in, in the blue on the left than was expected from the risk model. So the, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons takes into account many different clinical variables, um, uh, all of which are hand-entered by nurses that participate in, in their registry of cardiovascular programs. And, um, and, and the green bar represents how many deaths they expected, given how sick the patients were, given, uh, given their, their, um, their risk factors. The blue is lower, again, for the high-volume hospitals. But for the medium volume hospitals, especially the low volume hospitals, the, uh, the relationship is inverted. And so these low volume hospitals, again, substantiating what we know, which is that high volume is associated with better outcomes and low volume is a risk. Um, these low volume hospitals were taking on cases that they didn't have the experience to do and they weren't getting good outcomes in them. And so when Steve got his results. He published it as a, a data journalism piece in US News, um, and he named names. He identified the hospitals that had a uh, low volume of these surgeries. And even though statistically, they're, you know, one hospital's bad outcomes might just be chance, and so you couldn't necessarily say that that hospital was worse than average, by looking at the group of hospitals that fell in this bucket of low volume, um, it was very clear that they were in over their heads with these cases and they were getting bad outcomes. In fact, Steve and his colleagues uh, concluded that of the 400 deaths that occurred in these children and infants over the four year period of their study, that more than 100 of them could have been avoided if those patients had been treated at high volume centers. And so after Steve published this story, um, we heard that there was a lot of talk about it in the pediatric heart world. Um, and a couple of months later, I actually went to a, a transparency summit and I heard um, Dr. Bradley Marino speak there about the importance of making sure that high-risk kids in particular, the, the ones with the most severe and rare congenital heart defects, were treated at high volume centers. And he cited Steve's story. Um, and Dr. Marino uh, works in Chicago um, and um, at a children's hospital there. And what he said about Steve's story was that after it was published, he and his colleagues in Chicago noticed an almost immediate change in referral patterns in that city. And what they saw was that many more of the community cardiologists and, and, and pediatricians were directing patients to the high volume centers, that more of these high risk kids were getting treated at the hospitals that had the competence, the experience, and the teams in place to get them the best outcomes. And so I was really encouraged by that. I, I think it's a very optimistic um, observation that, um, that, that the reporting of quality measurement information, in this case in US News, can drive a change in practice patterns uh, toward better quality, toward, toward an improved process of triaging, essentially, patients to the hospitals that they need to get to. But at the same time that it filled me with optimism, it also gave me a pang of grief because I realized that my cousin hadn't benefited from that change in practice, um, and that many other kids, including 100 deaths that happened in that study, weren't averted because that public reporting came too late. And then I thought about all of the other areas of care where our public reporting doesn't yet exist or isn't as, as robust as it could be, and I realized that there will be many more avoidable injuries before public reporting realizes its full potential. And so 
it was against this backdrop of both optimism in understanding what had happened and grief in understanding when it had happened and why it had happened, that it needed to be published and, and, and pushed out for this change to, to happen, um, that I, I really saw my own job in a new light. And it is why, this is what animates me. This is why I come into work every day, is that I want to be able to help provide better information to the public, to the, to the patients, uh, to the parents, who need the sort of information, and, and to the doctors as well, because obviously Dr. Marino and his colleagues were thrilled that they were seeing more rational patterns of patient care. And so I think that we have this opportunity in measuring quality well, and in publicly reporting it well, um, to drive that kind of quality improvement and to help patients be more engaged with their care and to get the care that they need. Now I want to end, first of all, by thanking you for letting me address you this morning. I, um, I realize this is a little bit outside of your, your, your exact wheelhouse, but it's, it's really important to me, and I, and I hope that um, I've conveyed some of why I think it's important to society. Um, but I also uh, want to thank you for considering uh, a final question. When we hear people say, is measurement harmful? I think we should ask the question. We should ask whether they're really asking the right question. Because I think that perhaps a better question would be, in a world where, despite our best efforts, harm happens every day, how can we use public reporting and measurement to heal? Thank you very much. Thank you. We've saved, I've saved some time for questions, and so well, please come up to the mics. Um, I see one here at mic number two. Hi. Uh, Alan Klitschke, um, uh, thank you for that, for that excellent um, talk. When you say uh, that you don't use radiology in your reports, it's because people don't choose institutions based on the radiology department, and I believe that's true. But should that be true? I would argue that if, if your radiology, if the radiologist can find the, the finding uh, on the imaging scan that's important to the patient care, they make the correct, they might, they're more likely to make the correct diagnosis. If they're more likely to make the correct diagnosis, they're more likely to get appropriate care. If they're more likely to get appropriate care, they're more likely to do better. And I would, I think many of us in this, in this room would argue that if, the, probably the single most important department in a hospital that drives patient care in 2019 is the radiology department. So they're all, and we also not, not only make diagnoses, uh, we also do therapies, interventional therapies, nuclear therapies. Uh, so when, when someone has prostate carcinoma or neuroendocrine carcinoma, we can now give them therapy in the radiology department that actually treats their disease primarily. It's not a reflection of general surgery or urology. Yeah. It's a reflection of, of the radiology department. Right. You're absolutely so I right. Know, I realize that some of these things may be harder to measure, mm -hmm. but it should we, shouldn't we try to measure them? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So I think it's important to make a, diff a distinction between what we measure and how we report it. Um, and so you saw that we have a radiology working group for our pediatrics project, and that's because we do have radiology measures that we capture and use in, in our rankings. But because our focus is on patient decision support, we don't publish a ranking of radiology programs. In other words, if we were um, uh, you know, trying to identify uh, you know, which chairs are good leaders and which ones aren't, and that were our measure application, then we would need to uh, sort of rate the departments. 
But we're not interested in rating the departments. We're interested in rating the, the care of specific conditions or areas of clinical care so that patients and families can make a better decision. And so the radiology measures that we do use, we roll into those different areas. And some of them are used across multiple areas because they have to do with you know, the accuracy and appropriateness uh, um, of the care in many different specialty areas. And some are very specific to one area of care or another. Um, my, my wife is actually a, a stroke neurologist, and she works very closely with interventional radiologists, so I also know what you're talking about in terms of um, the interventional side. Um, we, you know, whether a case of, um, of, uh, of, endodire- a, 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 a case of, of intervention for a stroke is cared for, um, is done by a, a neurosurgeon or by an interventional radiologist or, or by some other specialist, that outcome is going to be incorporated into our evaluation of the hospital's neuroscience measurement rather than being pinned to a department that provided the physician that did it. Because again, the patient has a, has a neurological uh, condition. Well, I hope you consider actually evaluating radiology departments in the future at, at, in some way. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one more over here, and then we'll come back to six and eight. So um, I enjoyed your lecture, but I'm concerned that the outcome of your research will be to cause scarcity of resources. You're going to drive everybody to the clinic that can afford to go there for their heart disease. Um, you know, hospital number 50 may do a pretty good job, but anybody that can afford it is not going to go to the clinic. And the people that can't afford it are going to be stuck and have anxiety because they can't afford to go to the best. Mm-hmm. So why not take the data that you have, find the best hospital, and then figure out what the best practices are and disseminate that information you know, through the rest of the hospitals and remeasure and mm-hmm. see if they're getting better? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a great idea, and I think what you're, you're, you're suggesting in that second uh, component of your, your comment is the quality improvement piece, right? So if we can identify, and, and I believe we have, hospitals that are good at specific service lines or, or certain uh, areas of specialty care, um, we can hold them up as examples for others to follow. And though U.S. News isn't in the, uh, in the business of, of advising hospitals on uh, quality improvement, um, there are many opportunities that other organizations can, can provide around that. But I think your scarcity comment is, is a really uh, important one um, because Of course, if we only hold up a small number of hospitals and somehow give patients the uh, notion that those are the only places that can care for them, um, then it it could sort of create uh, too much pressure, too much demand for those hospitals. And there may be other hospitals that are actually very capable of taking care of many of those patients. And so that's actually one reason that over the past five years, we've been expanding our measurement program to look at some of these areas of, of, of common surgical procedures and conditions and we haven't identified a top hospital in the country for those things. As I showed you with hip replacement, we identified hundreds of hospitals that are high performing in hip. And we also identified some low performers. And the idea is, I mean, in almost every large or medium sized community in the country, there are multiple hospitals offering hip replacement, knee replacement, uh, even colorectal surgery, these other procedures that we evaluated. And what we want to be able to do is help patients make an informed decision among those choices locally. Most patients don't go to their insurance network, frankly, so they're not going to go across the country unless they have a, you know, a really unusual condition um, that, that warrants it. Um, but they will often have some choice within their community. And so for that reason, we've identified hospitals by service line that are high performers so that they can seek out one of those um, as opposed to a low performer that may be in their network and their in their vicinity. But won't this um, perpetuate the inequality of health care in this country? I mean, you, you have the people that can afford to go again to the clinic for their heart disease. They're going to go there. You know, and then you also have a self-fulfilling prophecies, prophecy because now you have the most affluent people going there and they're the ones that are going to take the best care of themselves after the procedure. Well, remember, we're using Medicare data. So if, at least for those with traditional Medicare, they have a choice of any of these hospitals. Um, it's not, uh, they're not constrained. Um, we're not looking at uh, commercial payers. Um, we're not looking at, uh, at self-pay. Um, so there, there's, I mean, I hear what you're saying, um, and, and these are important things to be thinking about, but the, 
it's not the case that only rich people can take advantage of our rankings. They're freely available, they're published on our website, and anyone who has Medicare certainly can choose among the hospitals that are available there. So I, I think that it's, it's important to measure the dynamics and to, to track the dynamics and understand what's going on uh, in terms of are we having unintended consequences. I don't see any evidence of that, and in fact, what we find is that hospitals that take care of the sickest tend to do the best in our rankings. Um, the, um, if, you, if you look at, um, at, at who is identified and what the, the social risk uh, of, that, of their patient population is, um, what the, the, uh, you know, the socioeconomic status of their communities and so on, we don't see a pattern toward the richest, um, the hospitals that treat the richest or the, or the, the best off being uh, the better ones. We, we, we identify hospitals that are high performing uh, in all walks. Um, so it's an it's, it's important question to raise, but I, I, don't, I don't see evidence of that happening right now. And we had a question over here at six and then one at eight. Hi, Elizabeth Hawk, nuclear medicine physician and neuroradiologist. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, in building off that, I, I am concerned about this data and its potential to make the best better mm -hmm. and the worst remaining inadequate. And I'm not concerned about patients that are going in and out of network. I'm concerned about the patients that are uninsured to begin with, mm -hmm. or the patients that literally can't afford the bus ticket to go across town. Um, I've seen that in my own community, having trained at LA County Hospital, and these healthcare inequities are real, and they're getting worse in our community. So I would love to see this data taken and overlapped mm -hmm. with healthcare inequity maps and access to care maps, and use them to drive meaningful change rather than perpetuating what we already have. Thank yeah, you. thank you for that comment. The, um, I, we share your concerns. <laughs> I chose not to include a slide on this, but one of the um, major undertakings that U.S. News has had over the last couple of years is actually building uh, a new rankings project, and it's called Healthiest Communities. And it looks, as you would expect, at all of the factors that you've described and identifies um, both those that have healthy communities today, though those aren't necessarily the ones we need to worry about, but also those that are making um, appropriate efforts to address them. And it, and it localizes what are the needs, what are the problems, what are the, the indicators, is it smoking, is it obesity, what, what, can be, what needs to be addressed and tackled in, in these communities. So that's available, uh, we actually published it for the, the second year, um, just a few months ago, it's available on the US News website, and I would encourage you to take a look at it. I don't oversee that project, which is why I, I didn't speak uh, about it before, um, but my colleagues who do have done a really thoughtful job, I think, of incorporating important factors into that and, uh, and thinking about how can we have the best impact on society through what we publish. Um, so um, one of the things that I'm interested in, in doing, and, and you had the same idea, is understanding hospitals that are in these communities, what are they doing to help those factors, because we know that hospitals now are looking far beyond their, their four walls in terms of what is their mission, what do they need to do for, their, for the, the communities, and how do, they, how do they address the community needs. Um, so I am really interested in, um, in looking at these patterns of, of social need and, uh, and, 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 and disparities in the U.S. News Healthiest Communities rankings and looking at what hospitals are doing in things like community benefits spending and community health needs assessments to understand can we see patterns in those data too? And can we identify hospitals, which may not be the ones that are great at clinical care, um, but can we identify hospitals that are actually doing great things to address the, the social needs in their communities? So that's work that's only getting underway now, um, but we're, we're two years in on, on the Healthiest Communities Project, um, and I, I would say keep an eye on it. It's, it's an area of great interest for us. Um, we have eight here. Um, uh, Roderick Williams um, from Massachusetts. I'm, I'm impressed to see the consistency of concern among my colleagues because uh, the gentleman at microphone number two, uh, the physician at microphone number six, uh, all of us have the same version of concern. Mm -hmm. Data is useful depending on what you do with it. Um, and I, to, to continue that line of concern uh, of hospitals that are uh, serving those who are left behind, have you considered geography? Um, in the, there are many hospitals in the southern states that have closed, making it so that the nearest hospital is one hour, two hour, three hours away. Um, 
and some of these hospitals that by their mission care for the, uh, provide critical access to those patients. Uh, have you looked at those patterns to see if there's a, a, a call for us to improve rather than just direct patients to easily accessible hospitals and urban centers? You know, it's, it's a really important question, and I have to admit, we have not looked at it empirically, um, but I have watched with growing distress as we've seen hospitals in some of the neediest communities in this country close. And one thing that I would say I find striking is that sometimes the very same health system that's closing a hospital in a disadvantaged community is opening a gleaming new facility 20 miles away in a wealthy suburb. Um, and, and I think there are, is information in those geographical patterns and in those data of opening and closing of hospitals and, and their relationships and the social needs and, and risks of the communities in which those hospitals are embedded or were embedded before they close that can be incredibly revealing. So it's something I, I would like to look at. Um, what one thing that I think has concerned a lot of people about the CMS measurement system, um, not just the star ratings, which frankly nobody really uses, but their financial penalties, particularly these readmission penalties that I mentioned earlier. Um, the concerning thing is that if a readmission for heart failure isn't really driven by the quality of the care the hospital provides, but by the social circumstance of the patient, then and, the, and if we financially penalize it, and so we give hospitals an incentive to avoid patients who are going to have readmissions, then hospitals actually have a rational incentive to close those hospitals in those poor areas and to open the gleaming facility 20 miles away. And I suspect that that's part of what's going on. And I think that if we did do uh, the rigorous analysis, and certainly US News doesn't have a monopoly on this because there are many researchers who are interested in asking that question as well, um, I think we would see some very revealing patterns about which health systems are good uh, corporate citizens and which ones are less so. Let me, I'll start here and we'll go back this way. So eight again. Thank you again for your uh, wonderful talk. I want to make sure I understand a uh, tie in your talk because it's something that I haven't heard uh, quite the same. We in, in medicine and particularly here in radiology have uh, tried and, and explored the uh, vexing juxtaposition between quality and quantity and moving to a value-based system. But if I understood many of your slides, uh, the underlying tone is that those with quantity tend to have a better quality outcome. Is that something that we need to uh, keep in our considerations? Uh, it, was I wrong in my hearing what you no, were saying? No, you're, you're right, and it's, it is a vexing issue. On the one hand, we know that uh, higher volume uh, centers get better outcomes, um, but we also know that there's overutilization. In some cases, um, say spine surgery, there's massive overutilization. And so how do we make sure that um, measurement effectively assesses appropriateness and incentivizes appropriate care and high value care instead of high quantity care. Um, that's still a work in progress, I will say, um, but what we've been um, having conversations with clinicians and, and health services researchers about is how we may be able to define certain patterns in the data of um, patients being treated appropriately um, or uh, of, of, of there being too much utilization of a particular service or perhaps not even over utilization, but utilization at a higher cost or, or less convenient or less supportive environment that might be necessary given the acuity of the, of the patient. Um, and so we're optimistic that we can develop some measures to make sure that we are calibrating, um, that we're looking at the appropriateness aspect too. I think we do have, actually there's one, one slide I'll, I'll briefly show you that, that does get at this. It's not from, hospital measurement, and it's not from doctor measurement, but we also, as I mentioned, rate um, hospitals, uh, sorry, rate nursing homes. And I think I have uh, a slide here. These were about risk aversion. Um, so uh, you, a couple of, a couple, maybe I'll come back to that one in a moment, but um, what, the, so there, there's CMS rates nursing homes, um, and we use, again, the same source data that they do to, to publish our nursing home ratings. 
Um, but what we, um, oh, let me uh, move ahead here. So what we did last year was develop um, a, a second rating of nursing homes. We had an overall rating and CMS had an overall rating, but nursing homes actually do two completely different services. They take care of patients who are, who are un unable to live on their own, and then they also take care of the post-acute patients, those who've, you know, they've had a stroke, they've had, a, had a, a hip fracture, and they just need some time to rehabilitate before hopefully going home. And so we wanted to look specifically at their performance in that subpopulation. So we developed this short-stay rehabilitation rating, and we identified a series of outcomes that we wanted to look at. But what I really want to focus on to answer your question is this measure of appropriateness that we looked at. And we, we call this um, patient-centered care uh, to distinguish it from billing-centered care. And the inspiration for this measure that we created actually came from a Wall Street Journal article that was published several years ago that looked at the, um, the utilization of uh, rehabilitation therapy in these post-acute patients. And one thing it found was that the payment structure is such that the more therapy you provide, the more you get paid. And there's certain thresholds, 720 minutes of therapy per week is one of the thresholds that bumps a nursing facility up into a higher uh, reimbursement um, bracket. Um, so the, so the, the Wall Street Journal uh, reported this, and then they reported that the utilization of the highest reimbursing uh, tiers of rehabilitation therapy had been growing very rapidly. In fact, by the end of this graph, um, it, more than half the patients who uh, were eligible received this extremely high amount of rehabilitation therapy, 720 minutes or more. And so you'd expect that if that was patient-centered, if that was sort of appropriate to the needs of the patient, um, that there would be quite a few patients who'd get 719 minutes and 718 minutes, and there'd be sort of a normal distribution of, uh, of, of provision of this service and the number of patients who, who received it at, at certain levels. But of course, that's not at all what the Wall Street Journal found, and that was why they had a front page story. Um, and what we did was we, um, in our short stay rating, was that we took the same data set and we assessed what is the proportion of the patients that, are, that a nursing home treats that got that uh, in that highest tier, and of those, which one just made the cutoff? In other words, they gave them just as much therapy as they needed to get that extra pot of gold and not a minute more, and not a minute less, which means they were overutilizing. And so what we did was develop this patient-centered rehabilitation measure, and it was, again, a proportion of the patients who received an amount of therapy that presumably is clinically necessary at times, but was not going to optimize the payment for the nursing home. And this is uh, how it's displayed, and this facility is actually just a couple of miles from here. Uh, only 7.5% of their short-stay residents got anything other than the amount of therapy that was going to maximize their reimbursement. And so I think that a pattern like that um, can be very revealing about whether a healthcare provider organization is providing patient-centered care or not. So uh, we have six over here. Hi. Hi, Vic Thomas from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk. I appreciate the concern. Okay. I appreciate the concern of some of my colleagues that this data may drive patients to better performing centers with better outcomes and compromised care at less well-rated facilities. However, rather than fear the data, maybe it's an opportunity to improve. And maybe this is an opportunity for some of the special so specialty societies, for example, the orthopedic surgeons, for them to form a task group and go to some of these hospitals that are highly rated by U.S. News and World Report find out why they're having better outcomes at those facilities, and then disseminate that information to their own membership so the quality of care can be improved in the local community hospitals. Thank you for that comment. I, I think that is probably, that is one of the motivations behind what we've seen is these growing networks of affiliates, of, of um, some major flagships, so teaming up with hospitals in other areas of the country to try to make sure that there is a, you know, you name it, a TAVR center in every, uh, in every major city and, and, and many smaller ones in the country. Um, and, and people don't have to go halfway across the country to get uh, an innovative therapy. Um, I think there, there's another motivation, which is, which is financial. Um, and so being able to differentiate those two and make sure that 
Um, I mean, as you saw in the, in the study that I highlighted, um, those affiliated centers are not necessarily as good in the highest acuity care um, as, as some of the, the US News ranked hospitals. But for many services, including aortic valve repair um, and, and many others that we think of as fairly high complexity, we can find high performing hospitals in every state and in most major communities in this country and in some very small communities as well. And so I think there is definitely hope for what you're describing that we can identify um, and help uh, the medical community identify where can we build a center of excellence in these different areas, different clinical areas and different geographical areas. I think I'm out of time, so I'm happy to answer other questions. I'll be out in the hall uh, afterward, but thank you very much, Dr. Zach, and all of you. Appreciate it.